This is the Indianness podcast. Stories of success from leaders and change makers of Indian origin. Why have Indians achieved success across so many different disciplines around the globe? I have no idea, but let's find out together because every story is unique. I'm really excited to have Soumya Gautipati with us today. She's the head of global supply chain technology at Estee Lauder, a luxury beauty brand company that most people are familiar with. But prior to this, she's also been in leadership roles at NBC Universal and AT&T. I invited her on this show as I was fascinated by her non-traditional journey in the media and the beauty industry. Welcome, Somia. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. Wonderful. So, Somia, uh, this podcast is Indianness. It's really about uh, chronicling your journey, the challenges, uh, inflection points, how you got here, how uh, it can be used to inspire folk. So, in order for us to do that, we really need to start right at the beginning uh, where uh, the journey began. So, if you can tell us uh, as much as you can about where were you born? Tell us about your parents, if there were grandparents involved. Uh, uh, just let's start with that and then uh, we'll dig deeper. Sure. So you're making me think really long time ago. <laughs> I know. Uh, Take your I time. Was, uh, sure, sure. I was uh, born in a small place in India, uh, in a state called Andhra Pradesh. And um, my parents uh, were both the teachers. My mom used to teach biology and English. My dad was uh, math and English uh, teaching. And uh, they both uh, have been retired as a principal to Paul high school. Um, so that's where my journey really began. Um, I have uh, one younger brother. Um, he also actually lives in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, I guess that growing, growing up in in a household with the two teachers, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Somia, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, so firstly, what was the name of the town uh, in Andhra Pradesh that you were born? Um, it's really my grandparents' village. It's called Chartapalli. <laughs> I probably never heard of it, may never hear it. It's a really, really small place. Um, but um, I was born there, but uh, my parents moved around because of the jobs and stuff. So I ended up growing, growing up in different places, all small places in and around that area. Um, so probably around every three years or so, we were moving when I was growing up specifically. Um, and then once I finished my 10th grade, then I moved to Vizag, also called Vishakapatnam. Um, that's where I did my 11th and 12th or intermediate, it used to be called. And then um, I got into engineering at Andhra University. I did the mechanical engineering at Andhra University. Um, once I graduated from there, then I came to the United States for my, my master's. So just to uh, head back again in time, uh, mom and dad were moving around every, let's just say three years. Uh, both were academics. Uh, you had a sibling. How was that, you know, because you have to kind of get into a new environment every few years and moving was all in Andhra Pradesh, right? Correct. So uh, how was that for uh, Soumya to create new friends, a new environment, etc.? cetera? Just uh, walk us through that. Uh... Sure. You know, looking back, I... Um... I guess how they say kids are resilient, right? That was probably true with me. And it did, I don't think it bothered me. At least I do not remember instances where, oh, I'm having a hard time fitting into the school. None of that. Maybe because my, my parents were teachers, maybe that helped as well. Maybe that provided that, that security and additional comfort. Uh, so that wasn't, a, you know, not a, that big of a deal. Uh, but, you know, because my parents were teachers, the household was, you know, we grew up in a very disciplined environment and, you know, 
getting lower grades were not an option, <laughs> right? Not doing well in school was not an option. And uh, um, looking back, I think uh, I proud to say I had actually a good, happy childhood. Um, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, were, were your parents teaching in the same school that you were going to school in? Uh, in high school, yes. In high school. Uh, not in the elementary level, but uh, in high school, high they school. were teaching. Um, yeah. <laughs> but not in the primary school. So in primary school, uh, the medium of education, was it in Telugu, Hindi, it, English? Yeah. It, it was the Telugu, the local medium. Um, okay. So uh, you were going to school in Telugu. Uh, parents obviously had very high expectations. Um, were there any uh, basically subjects that you were kind of drawn to early on, uh, Somia? It's certainly math was my favorite subject growing up. I used to really like, uh, you know, solving equations. And even like uh, throughout my uh, educational year, even like when I got into engineering, for example, I hated to remember for long, big formulas. And instead, I even in the exam, I would rather derive the formula myself and work through the problem, problem itself uh, versus memorize. So kind of like really like the challenge of solving things. So I certainly was drawn to uh, math. So math was uh, something that you were uh, drawn to. Now at home, uh, either was mom or dad, anyone helping with homework or... Uh, you know, working with you at all? Not so much a homework part. They didn't have to help with the homework because mm -hmm. typical now, uh, but they would teach me, I guess, at being, uh, so that I could be ahead of the uh, right. class or, you know, I could keep up and be ahead. I think that that's where probably uh, they taught me and even in summer holidays. <laughs> Oh, I used to hate it in those days, but uh, I guess that's probably looking back, that's a good thing. Even in summer holidays, we still had to spend like about an hour or two in the afternoon <laughs> with books. books. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was not really a holiday per se, from completely from books. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, were the courses tough, uh, Somia, in the early uh, primary school? I mean, what, what is your recollection? Or was it easy for you? No, it was easy for me. It was. Um, it was easy for yeah, you. And that too, yeah, that too, you know, I, like you said, I grew up in a small places. So yeah. probably the environment was not like that competitive or, mm. you know what I mean? So because I was always just like several steps uh -huh. about, you know, my, higher than the rest of the kids. So that, yeah, it wasn't a problem. <laughs> um, did you make any friends early on in school? Uh, how was that? I did. Um, I think the difference is, um, I mean, I had friends, but because we were moving every three years or so, I didn't have long lasting friendships. So I don't think I'm in touch with any of my school friends, if you will. Uh, college and all, yes, but going back to high school, not exactly, uh, or even elementary for that matter. Um, that's one aspect of it because of the moment, et cetera. And the second aspect of it is also, um, I, how do I describe it? I kind of was raised in a quite differently from the rest of the girls around me, where most girls, most households in India, especially in those days, um, they had to pay attention at home or they were not, once they got home, they didn't come out to play on the street or like to do other things. Whereas I wasn't raised that way. Once I got home, I was kind of free and play and whatever. And then a lot of students of my parents, they used to come home for, I don't know, either as a tuition or like something or the other, or mostly boys. And I used to play with them, never restricted in, in, so because of that reason, yeah, I had like a lot of friends to play with and, you know, do all of that, right. but not necessarily, you close, know. <laughs> close bonding. Yeah, close, yeah, close friends. 
So uh, these boys, you'd come over for tuitions, etc., and you would play. What would you play? What kind of games were you? Uh, uh, you like a badminton, or maybe sometimes the board games, or you know okay. things of that nature. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's great. Uh, so as uh, time went on, uh, you kept moving. Were grandparents at all in the picture here, uh, Somya? Yeah, my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was very um, uh, progressive um, for him, and I think that carried to my parents, and you know, and then to me. Is he was very progressive in terms of he believed in education is the gateway to better life. So um, he always, always encouraged um, his kids and grandkids to focus on that. And um, so that's how I think we all kind of inherited that mindset, if you will. Um, but they all lived a little far away, like a couple of hours from home, my, my hometown. Um, and we used to go there every holidays, um, festivals or summer holidays and stuff. So that used to be the main place we used to go. And yeah, that was fun part. And my grandmother actually raised me until I was uh, three or four or something like that because my mom was working and so my grandmother actually raised me. And she raised my brother too when he was young. So you were reasonably close to the grandparents? Yeah, very, very close. Yeah. Yeah. And um grand uh, dad was very progressive. He wanted all the kids, boys, girls to get educated. Uh, yeah. and especially in those times that uh, you know, a pretty progressive viewpoint. Um yeah. and then uh, your brother, how uh what's the d difference in age between him and you? Uh so he's about five years younger than me. Five years younger than you. Okay. Okay. Um and then you, uh, as you were moving uh, towards high school, uh, what? How did you decide that you wanted to go to Vishakhapatnam by Zach? What was the thought process there? I mean, there were, I guess, influ <laughs> influences. It's uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, well, so where I was, the village that I was growing up. You know, tenth grade was the last no, the last grade you can do. After that, you gotta go somewhere. So I had a couple of options: one, go to and go into a residential college, uh, residential school, and do eleventh and twelfth, right? Um, or go to Vishakhapatnam, where a cousin of mine was uh, there at the time. He was uh, doing his M Tech, and uh, he said, "Why?" I would like to take her with me and she could stay with me and go to attend college there. And also I can actually help her with her education or tuition or whatever, that kind of stuff. And it was very, <laughs> I think, brave of my parents to let me go that way and let me stay at that delicate age of uh, 15 or 16, right? Um, with the boy cousin, <laughs> but uh, I uh, I think that was you know, that was really I think it created a lot of uh, opportunities and opened doors a lot of, uh, for me because uh, Vizag was a it's, it is a huge cosmopolitan city. Um, because of that, you see all you know all sorts of people like um, well, you know from north south you know different uh, cultures uh, come together. Um, I think that that actually gave me a lot of exposure, um, a bigger picture thinking and, uh, and, you know, ability to speak, speak English and, uh, uh, all those kinds of things. So look, I, I think I'm, it was very hard. I have to be honest with you. The first year or so is very hard because it's going from a small place to a big, big place. And, um, you don't quite fit, <laughs> you know, both from, uh, um, you know, dressing up point of view as well as the speaking and, you know, habits and everything else. And it's almost like you learn a lot of, you have to learn a lot of things. So obviously, you know, it was hard initially, but then after the first year, you know, it just became yeah, natural and uh, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, that was one, I would say, probably a turn, good turning point. Yeah, it seems like a big uh, turning point, inflection point. So let's. Uh, so was that a decision made by your parents, or did you make the decision to go to Isaac? Uh, 
uh, it was my parents and it, okay. I didn't resist or anything. It was, you know, um, if because I had the said, no, I absolutely, yeah, absolutely don't want to go and they would have been fine with it. But mm. uh, it was primarily their decision. And the first year was very hard. Was ever in your mind that I want to just go back? I don't want to be here. Did that ever come in your mind? <laughs> I'm sure it crossed my mind at times. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. this was your first exposure to, uh, in many cases, people from around the country, as as you rightly said, from the north, east, west, uh, right. because you were from the village. And now, right. uh, was the medium of instruction in English in Vizak? Yeah, that was English, yeah. So was that also a little hard for you, uh, Somia? Or was that was not? Yes, as... it was. Yeah, certainly it was, uh, it, it was hard. But if I remember right, I think the hardest part was really not having a parent with you. It's like you don't have that security blanket with you. You don't have that comfort when you, you know, when you are <laughs> down. You don't have something to fall back to, go back home. And to, yeah, yeah, I think that was problem. Emotionally, I think that, is, that was the harder part. Um, yeah. Uh, was were you staying in a dorm uh, during that time, or how was it? And no, it was it was their house. So you were staying with your cousin at that point. Yeah, yeah. So that was a big uh, relief, at least to have that kind of a support system, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how were the studies? Where did you find uh, because of the change going from village to Vizag, going to English medium? How did you react to uh, academically uh, there, uh, Samia? Um, I mean, I think I had to work much harder in the beginning um, because it just takes extra time, right? Uh, but I think once I got the hang of it, I, I was totally fine. Um, you know, it, eventually, it, it eventually, yeah, like I said, maybe it took like a little more than six months to get adjusted to pick up the speed kind of a thing but once I got the hang of it I think I made good friends there so they used to help me as well um so yeah eventually it worked out well and you uh, started making some friends uh also you mentioned yeah. in Wysak yeah. and who kind of helped you um yeah. and these were uh you know, uh, friends who are also probably going through the same situation as you are uh, coming into Isaac, et cetera, right? Mm, not, not really, but most of them were locals. They Local? grew up there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, were you also still focusing on math and uh, what were uh, the focus at that time? Um, I, I think, you know... I didn't do the CBSD route. Uh, I did the typical Indian. Uh, so when you go to 11th grade, you have to do either MPC or BIPC, maths, physics, chemistry, or biology, physics, chemistry. So I was in the maths, physics, chemistry route. Um, the way it works in Andhra is you do that for two years, MPC uh, group, and then uh, you give an entrance to get into engineering school. Um, uh, so that was the path I chose to go because of my interests. Um, yeah. And so uh, when you did the 11th and the, uh, the 12th, then you did your entrance exam? Yeah. 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 And so how, how did you fare in that entrance exam for engineering? I, I think I did very well um, because in those days, um, this is Andhra specific. Um, and to take care of them. So about uh, in those days, I think about 80,000 or one lakh kids used to give the entrance. Um, and then there were about a uh, total of 3,000 seats available. And then out of which about a total of 1,000 are from university colleges. The other 2,000 are more private colleges where you pay a lot more uh, tuition and, and you know, um, it's a, I guess, next level below, if you will. So you have to be, you want to be in a good college. <laughs> you had to be in the top thousand kind of a thing. Um, so I think my rank at that time was like 600 or something like that. Um, wow. Yeah. 
that's uh, pretty good. Um, so then you got um, you were six hundred out of I don't know what three lakh people. My gosh, uh, one lakh. One lakh. Okay, well yeah. that's still yeah. given uh, the things that we think are competitive here. That's uh, pretty impressive. So then you got uh, admitted into an engineering college. Which engineering college and where? Why is that? In Vizag? Uh, Andhra University. Yeah, in Vizag. Andhra University Engineering College. It's a university okay. college. Uh, and uh, what uh, area did you pick? What, did you have to pick a specialization? Uh, yeah, I did mechanical engineering. Mechanical. Because at that time, I think everything was kind of mechanical. was the big uh, yeah. thing at that time. Yeah. I mean, net computer science and electronics were also actually, they were the top priority. Mm. Um, but my rank was 600 high. So you couldn't um, get That was uh, not available for me. Yeah. The next option is the mechanical engineering. Mechanical. So that's how it, it went. Yeah. So then you joined the Andhra University, the mechanical engineering uh, program. Uh, uh, how did mom and dad react to? Uh, you know, you uh, doing the mechanical engineering work, was that, uh, did they say, hey, uh, were they supportive of that? Did they want you to pick something else? No, they were very supportive of it. They didn't have any concerns. They were like, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's what, you, you know, it's up to you kind of a thing. Uh, and they also know that eventually it may not, it's not end all be all, right? Uh, so along the way, you choose the path, path that best suits you. So as long as it's engineering education, you know, once you have the good foundation, then you can uh, do different things afterwards, depending on, you know, what you like. Well, that's great. So how was uh, Andhra University when you joined uh, academically, socially? Tell us a little bit about um because now you're going from a school, even though it was high school, to, you know, now you're going to a bigger pond uh, or a, maybe a maybe a little bit of a larger lake more than a pond. So, Right. Actually, that actually turned out to be much easier for me because by this time, I was a local in Vizag. <laughs> so, and many of my uh, uh, cohort is, uh, they are like from different places. So that gave me comfort. I'm much more confident now because I know the place really well, you know, all of that. And academics, they were fine. You know, it's there. I mean, there are some tough exams and not so tough. It's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, that wasn't a problem. Um, but one thing I think that was, I wish it was different, but um, like, because it's, mechanical engineering uh, and it, I was in a way lucky because you we were at least two girls in a class of 35. Um, wow. You know, only two girls yeah. in the whole class. <laughs> yeah, only two girls in the whole class. <laughs> so that's the tough part right? because yeah, you just don't have enough of that interaction and uh, in those days it's still boys and girls are separate and like not as much of an open society uh, at that time. Um, so that's one thing I felt like I didn't get a full experience of college, enjoying the college because of that. Um, mm. So is that more socially or academically or both? It's socially. Yeah, academically, there was no issue in my, because it didn't really matter. Uh, even in uh, labs, I mean, we were fine, like, we had to do welding and like those kinds of things. And it, it was fine. That wasn't a problem. Um, and I'm generally um, more on the adventure tomboy side anyway, naturally speaking. So that, no, that, doesn't, that didn't bother me. It was more socially. <laughs> hmm. So it, because it was very restricted, uh, there were just two of you right. and right. probably spending time with each other. Right. <laughs> by force, choice, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so uh, were there things that you were starting to gravitate towards in the mechanical engineering area, Somia? I think some of the uh, um, things that I, I mean, within the mechanical engineering, I, I think the engineering drawing was something that I felt I was really, really good, like visualizing. 
um, the designs and things of that nature. And also anything with the logic is really what I like. So some of the engineering mechanics and uh, fluid mechanics and internal combustion engines, like I, I really liked uh, that side of things. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you like to tinker with things. Is that fair to say? It, you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a solving a puzzle. Solving is, uh, a puzzle. What I like. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So mechanical engineering uh, was hopefully giving you that outlet to solve the puzzle, maybe visualize uh, issues, etc. cetera. Uh, did it become uh, clear to you a little bit during those uh, that time that where your uh, inclinations are uh, or it took you a little later? I'm trying to figure out where was a little bit, was there an aha moment uh, there or not? So I think by end of first year of engineering or maybe beginning of second year, I have decided or at least it became clear to me what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to get into um, management side of things. Um, so I decided I wanted to do one of the two things I want to do at the end of the graduation. And that is either coming to us and pursue the higher education and, and um, do something big. Or if I stay in India, I wanted to go into uh, IAM and do an, get an MBA from one of the IAMs. So that's the decision I made, I think probably either end of first year or, or beginning of the second year of my college years. Um, so, and that's when I started preparing for it. Not so much towards IAM uh, MBA side because that had a lot more time, but uh, researching about uh, U.S. colleges and what do I need to do to prepare for it and uh, talking to different people to understand what it takes and what my options are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I laid the groundwork starting in my second year. And then uh, third year is when I took my GRE and stuff. Uh, so that by the time I graduated, I had everything ready. Um, so, but how did you come upon uh, the thought uh, that you wanted, wanted to focus in on management? And then the second question would be that pursuing U.S. Uh, were there other people who were around you, et cetera? So it's basically a two-part question because uh, we try to tell our uh, listeners, you know, uh, how decisions get made, what thought process goes into it. Sometimes they are right, sometimes they are not. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to understand is what, what was the thought process? That... I think the kind of about coming to U.S. is like, it certainly there were a few other people that I knew that either already came here or in the process of coming. Um, and so that kind of inspired me. I think one of the things that I, um, was a push for me is, uh, number one, obviously, you know, pursue uh, education and experience a different uh, life, that type of stuff, right? And the second thing is also, I, I'm, I'm a person, uh, I, I like, it sounds corny, but I like freedom, if you will. Uh, I think I felt a little suffocated in Indian culture at that time. As a girl, I couldn't do a lot of things that I wanted to do because you're always judged by, oh, you know, why you, sh you should not do this as a girl, you should not do that. Um, those types of things, I am not, I don't fit into that mold, a traditional mold. And for me, like going to US would give me the opportunity to go away from that and really do what I want to do. Um, as an example, um, a more, more of a concrete example, actually, I wanted to become a pilot growing up. Um, <laughs> right, that was my sort of like... <laughs> Think it a dream, if you will, right? <laughs> but uh, obviously, that was not possible for many reasons. Number one, you know, it it, it used to be very, very expensive. It's not mm -hmm. achievable for, it's not reachable for a common person. Um, and the second thing is, I guess I didn't even know how to go about it or like it, there's nobody around me that is remotely <laughs> into that. And like, it's just, it, it was just a fantasy. It remained as a fantasy, if you will. 
Um, but we, we can come to that later. Like once I came to this country, I actually pursued that. But um, keep it. so like that, I have it. I'm not, I don't fit into the traditional mold um, is what I'm trying to say. So I think that's what really pushed me to come here from the United States and to do other things. Um, management is another one where I also felt like pursuing management, it gives you that opportunity to be yourself, um, um, you know, to do, <laughs> at least you have a lot more leverage. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm trying to unpack because you said some very, very important things. Obviously one is that you felt a little to use the word, maybe a suffocated because there was a box that uh, that was kind of at that time specifically. Uh, and you wanted to really go out of that box and you thought the U.S. would offer you those opportunities from maybe conversations you had with other people or information that flowed. That's one. Number two was, uh, you know, that uh, you wanted to be a pilot. Now, from uh, what age and why uh, did you want to be a pilot? Had you flown in a plane before? No, I think it was. <laughs> so tell us how uh, the genesis of that, that's very important because there's a further story as we will talk about when we talk about because when you came to the US, but I uh, do want to hear where did that thing strike? And as you know, now there are many, many female pilots, but let's just talk about what, where was your interest in being a pilot? How? I think, um, well, it started off as an admiration for, you know, man landing on the moon and, uh, you know, some of the uh, astronauts, uh, like, uh, for some reason, Valentina Tereshkova, who, who was the first uh, astronaut, female astronaut from Russia, right? Like, those are the things that I grew up studying about. And I think that, like, Oh, I want to be the first woman from India to be doing this. Like those are the kinds of thoughts that that I had growing up. I think that's what created that inspiration. And because of that, I want to be a pilot or, or I want to be an astronaut. Like it was more of that. Um, just studying about you know whether it be Neil Armstrong or Valentina Cheshko or like any of those uh, people. That's what really used to inspire me. Um, so breaking the mold, maybe trying something unknown with what some of these astronauts had done and maybe, you know, flying a plane also is sort of a freedom too because you are going up. Uh, obviously, some people are scared, but that maybe that's what is what was kind of uh, uh, interesting for you, uh, Soumya. Yeah, no, uh, that... Uh, and then you mentioned about management, that management would give you a lot of freedom. So if you notice, uh, Somia, the word freedom, breaking the mold comes across uh, you in many ways. Uh, breaking the mold is also about freedom. Uh, flying uh, also in some ways, uh, as people will, astronauts will tell you, it's about freedom. Management uh, was about freedom because Maybe you felt a little restricted uh, at that time uh, in India or maybe in those circumstances. And then uh, what about your parents? They were supportive of uh, you going into management or going into the, to the U.S., etc.? Yeah, absolutely. My parents, uh, like I said, because of my grandfather's influence or whatever, my mom and my dad were also very much like that. They were very progressive. So they never re restricted me at home to do things this way versus that way. Um, I remember growing up, like my mom never told me to come and help her in the kitchen. She never ever asked me to do that. I didn't learn cooking growing up for the most part. <laughs> um, so I had that freedom at home per se, but when you step into the larger society, it's different. I still had to conform to the norms and um, probably, you know, that probably felt, I felt a lot more constrained because of that or restricted because of that. But um, my parents were extremely supportive. And uh, in fact, when I was coming to U.S. or when I made the decision to come to U.S., um, 
you know, a lot of people told them, like, how are you sending? She's a girl, not married. You know, how are you able to say, why are you sending her? It's not safe or like, aren't you worried? Um, you know, a lot of different, it's going to be expensive and all those things. But my parents were like, you know, she has the opportunity. She you know, got the opportunity and she wants to go and we, we want to send her. Um, I think this will open up a lot more doors for her. Um, so we don't want to stop it. So looking back, you know, sometimes I think about this. Uh, when I, at the airport, I don't know, I was very excited to come. And they were also excited to see me off, but we didn't cry or anything. We just said goodbye very nice, cheerfully wow. to each other. And Right? Now, if I have to send my daughter away, I think yeah. I will try. <laughs> Uh, you've got tough parents, man. Uh, so uh, maybe one of the things about that freedom was you had so much freedom at home. And when you step out, maybe there were some constraints, whether it was society, et cetera, et cetera. And you didn't want that. And you wanted the freedom that you probably observed because of the progressive nature of your parents, your grandparents. Maybe that's where the urge for freedom came. And uh, so then you did your GRE. Uh, so tell us, uh, and you did your GRE and you uh, got admission in uh, which college? And then we'll come to that so airport to scene. A... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I went to North Carolina State, NC okay. State, NC State. Uh, uh, in Raleigh. Yeah. Wonderful. Jim Valvano's uh, uh, university, right? Where yeah. uh, That's he... right. Wow. You, you uh, know him. <laughs> uh, of course. He's... Uh, you know, just an incredible uh, man. Unfortunately, he passed away, but he made that, you know, uh, improbable talk about of all the, I mean, I can talk about that. Uh, it's a separate podcast, but uh, so uh, you uh, came here, uh, you got admission in NC State. You left the airport, mom and dad, were, they waved you goodbye. You said goodbye because there was no issue and then you landed in uh, North Carolina. Did you have any friends, yeah. relatives, et cetera? How was that? Yeah, um, a, a friend was there. Somebody we knew very well. Like he received me. And uh, um, then, you know, there were a lot of other Indian students as well. So I just, you know, roomed with somebody. Like any place, like anything, first semester was obviously extremely hard. Um, you know, you come here and, <laughs> it's cold to start with. <laughs> you, you probably went through a very similar experience yourself. I think all of us went through at some point. Uh, a cold and, you know, the language to some extent, it's English, but still it's quite different. And the way of teaching, uh, the classes are quite grading and all of that is different. Um, and then you also have to look for work, part-time work and, you know, juggling a lot of things. It was certainly hard. I'm not, I, I would be lying. I would be lying if I didn't. And then, you know, first semester was, you know, my dad paid for it, which was good. But, you know, from second semester onwards, I had to fend for myself. So, which puts like, a, you know, because I certainly didn't want to go back and ask my parents for more money. <laughs> um, so that's another thing, you know, looking for some kind of assistantship and, you know, like working part time, like, it was, you know, hardship going through, but I think that those are all the kinds of things that make you stronger. You learn from it and that's what builds a character. So, um, yeah. So how did you find, uh, I mean, the first semester dad paid for it, mom and right. dad pay for it, but, uh, you also knew the clock was ticking and you yeah. had to find an assistantship and there are many people looking for assistantship students from all over the world. So how, uh, how, how were you able to uh, find it? And um, tell us a little bit about that. It was, uh, you know, I guess that talking to, I think that that's where network, value of networking. Uh, became, I, I became aware of value of networking probably. How? Um, how? <laughs> uh, but that's a, because that's to, an important lesson for our guests, uh, for our listeners, sorry. Right. Right. So like 
how do you find which professor has what funds and you know which department and all of that right like I, there is no like nothing is posted anywhere in a job board or anything like that you it we really have to know through somebody uh, that knows the information so by talking to other students they say oh yeah this department got recently these funds from i don't know doj or whatever right like um, maybe you should talk to that professor. So like that, you kind of gather the information and then you go talk to different professors and give uh, your pitch saying that, hey, you know, I have these kinds of skills and I would love to work on your project. You know, okay, <laughs> is there an opportunity? You talk to 10 of them and, uh, you know, if you're lucky, one will accept you and take you under their wings. So, so I think that's how that happened. Um, but, you know, uh, like in, um, yeah, like anything else, it's like knocking on a lot of doors and uh, finding that right uh, information and pursuing it without getting discouraged whenever you hear a no. <laughs> yeah, so it was knocking on a lot of doors, but uh, not giving up because you were just in your second semester and, yeah. you know, just four or five months uh, away from leaving home and you didn't get discouraged. You were, in fact, probably... Uh, in a sense of urgency, right? That I've got to get this yeah, internship absolutely. because, yeah. Right, absolutely, because going back is not an option at that no. point. <laughs> and uh, not paying tuition is not an option either. Correct, uh, exactly. Because you have your visa situation and all those other good things that happen. Right. So you were able to find someone who, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, took you uh, as an, an uh, how, who was that and how did that happen? Uh, so at NC State, there was this uh, department, um, textile engineering department. Which is a big um, one in NC State, by the way. They're very yeah, well known right. for uh, textile. Right. Yeah. You seem to know a lot about NC State. No, I know That's NC cool. State quite a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one of the professors there, they got a lot of fun, uh, funding that year. Um, and my concentration has been industrial engineering. And... Uh, so there was a project that was a um, combination of industrial engineering joint uh, project between industrial engineering department and textile engineering department. So I was able to join that. He uh, joined that project through that professor. Um, and my, you know, the thesis and the concentration was around, uh, um, you know, you know forecasting uh, for apparel uh, companies and things like the optimization, um, design of experiments and that type of stuff. Um, Something like operations research, supply yeah, chain. Yeah, it, it was operations research. OR, yeah, basically, yeah. we used to yeah. call it OR in those days. Correct, correct. Uh, well, that's fantastic. So how was that experience uh, uh, being uh, working as an intern or an assistant, teaching assistant there? I think with that, I felt much more settled by the time second semester rolled out, because by the time I, good friends, you know, and settled in the environment. Now, financially, I feel secure. I feel like that's a huge thing for anybody. Once you feel financially secure, then everything else will come in place. If you don't have the financial uh, you know, stability, I think everything sort of falls apart and it just would have a domino effect. So I think that really, you know, uh, comforted me. And then so that now I can concentrate on my um, grades and, you know, all the other aspects um, of it. After that, it just became, uh, you know, autopilot, if you will, for the next uh, year and a half or so. Well, till <laughs> you started, you still you had to look for a job. job. Graduation time and look for a job. <laughs> and it begins all over again. Uh, right. So how was it? So let's say you <clears throat> graduated mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how was that experience? And then looking for a job, uh, Somia, tell us uh, it was, what, what happened. Uh, it, I mean, this was in 1996. Um, it's just a coming out of recession, I think. Job market was just about improving. So it was kind of a mixed bag, if you will, you know, um, I mean, I probably sent out 50 or 100 resumes and finally um, um, AT&T uh, actually reached out to me 
Um, and that's how, you know, I joined at and um, either through internet, I don't remember exactly how it, you know, how it all happened, but I got a call from at and and said, would you be interested in it? So I felt extremely lucky. Uh, I mean, looking compared to many other people, I probably didn't have to try that hard. I got the job while I was still in school before I graduated. You know, that is a tremendous, tremendous comfort. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, now, at and where in North Carolina, New in Jersey? In New Jersey. New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Bell Labs. Uh, used Bell to be Labs. Bell Labs. Yeah. That's a great institution. One of the best research institutions. So uh, yeah. what were you uh, hired to do there, Somia? Um, I was hired as a process engineer because of my operations research background. And because also, you know, by that time, in my cohort in that year time, we were all computer savvy. Most of us knew programming, you know, database design and that type of stuff. I was, even though I was um, industrial engineering operations research major, but we also acquired these skills just because, you know, because of the timing, if you will. Um, so I think that, that kind of combination was attractive. It was, uh, for the for a, a role that they hired me for, so I was jo I joined as a process engineer, and the um, the job was to uh, one was like a do simulation modeling and optimization for call centers, um, you know the queuing theory and all of that, like the do simulation modeling uh, based on number of calls coming, like that, that kind of stuff. Similar other projects were optimizing the process for their uh, product development. Um, yeah, it was that type of stuff and along with some, uh, web development and things like that as well. Um, so how many years did you stay in at and uh, from... I stayed there for a long time. I think I was there for 15 plus years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but doing different, different things, right? Not the same thing. Right. I would say, I think on an average, every three years or so, I changed it all in at and I think that was a good thing. Um, that was a good thing about at and because it is so large that you can move around and it's almost like the starting a new job every time because, you know, depending on the job you take, obviously. Uh, so I, I feel like I owe a lot to at and um, because I joined there as a fresh uh, you know, graduate, right? No industry experience, etc. But at and was such an institute um, for not only for the research, but the management principles and leadership principles and organizational dynamics and all of it. It really was an institute. So I picked up many of skills that are so useful to me as uh, right, uh, today. I think I picked them up there and I, I felt, I feel like I was trained well in, in that company. So another inflection point, would you say that uh, getting hired by at and and the opportunities, yeah, absolutely. opportunities you got because every few years you were kind of moving around, learning different, different, different skills that kind of built your foundation. Yep, absolutely. That that was foundation was I think super critical. Um, it really built my foundation and also technology wise because AT and T is such a technology company. They're always on the cutting edge. So because of that reason, I was able to move with the times in terms of technology advancements. Um, you know, I joined as a process engineer, but then a couple of years later, I moved into uh, IP network where IP networks was just coming before that it was like ATM and frame relay and then IP network. So I was part of the team that built uh, IP backbone for the you know, for the company. Then I moved into voice over IP when that was you know and similarly, yeah. You know, in two thousand nine, before I left the company, I was responsible for a cloud infrastructure when cloud was just starting. So it gave me those kinds of opportunities for me to grow and learn constantly. Um, well, and created that I mean, such a valid, yeah, very strong technology foundation. You talk about frame relay, IP, uh, voice over uh, VOIP, uh, all the things that uh, someone can use now. 
So then you moved to where uh, after 15 years? Um, I think one of the inflection points during at and that really happened was, I think that is another huge inflection point for me. Um, this was, I want to say 2002, something like that around that time. I had this opportunity to take on a role as a technology advisor for CTO and president of at and Labs. Uh, so I was directly working with him and uh, my job was to sort of be like a technology advisor to him, um, do some external research and uh, keeping him abreast of latest technologies or, uh, you know, what our vendors are doing and what the next frontier is or get some of his uh, other researchers to come and share their perspectives on certain new tech and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so as part of that, um, this was 2002, AT&T was just a long distance company at that time. And uh, it was looking to, uh, we were losing revenue significantly at that time. So we needed uh, some kind of an alternative. Um, so our charter was to uh, research alternative, last mile alternatives, like how do we get to the home uh, last mile, right? Because at and didn't have access like Verizon and the other battle uh, companies had it. at and did. Um, so I was able to lead that project, uh, work with obviously his direct report team and put together a strategy, a uh, last mile strategy. And we went through 10 different technologies from power line to Wi-Fi to, um, you know, voice over IP and, you know, many different uh, line of sight and like, you know, many different things, 10 different as it's in the ROI and all that kind of stuff, you know, big strategy document. And uh, he presented to board of directors at that time. And because of the way things were, you know, there was no silver bullet, but we felt like voice over IP was the um, way we need to invest. Um, and uh, he presented that strategy and our recommendation and the board of directors approved it and said, yes, let's go invest in voice over IP. Um, and then he, um, because of, I did that whole, you know, I was in leading that whole thing and I like, you know, just go and implement it. So then I left that role and um, moved on to actually implementing that voice over IP style, you know, actual implementation of it. So that whole experience was like phenomenal. I don't think you can pay enough to get that type of experience because I was, you know, at a young age, seeing how the C-level um, executives <laughs> work and the thinking behind the strategy, you are all the, all the things that matter. And like, I got the direct, the direct exposure of it. I think that, that was, you know, invaluable experience for me. That really changed my thinking going forward. Well, phenomenal. I mean, because you were out there researching, finding out what's going to happen in the future. Uh, right. And then you are feeding that information to C-level executives. I mean, it's uh, priceless. But how did you go out and uh, ask for that position or did they come to you? How did you get that very, very critical position in your career? Um, I think when the opening was uh, happened, when... Um, my VP at that time was his direct report and he became aware of the opening and he recommended for that. Well, that's how I ended up. <laughs> well, you must have done a great job for him to recommend. So, but uh, a very critical uh, inflection point because it gave you tremendous uh, exposure, especially in voice over IP, which even now uh, is a you know key aspect of uh, telcos right now. Uh, so that was another big inflection point. So now uh, when you moved from uh, AT&T, uh, what happened? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. How did that come across? Um, so I go back a little bit. So I did the voice over IP, uh, I think four or five years or so. And I was kind of like stable, going on an autopilot, if you will, because things sort of settled and all that. 
And then you don't like autopilot. You don't like autopilot, uh, Somia. Sorry. No, I don't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I get I know. very bored. <laughs> uh, we can figure that out. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you like <laughs> pilot, but you don't like autopilot. How about that? <laughs> right. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. So my husband and I, we decided to uh, start a family. Um, and then, you know, I became pregnant. And interestingly enough, I, after that, I got, I panicked. I'm like, oh my God, you know, uh, I always wanted to do, go to business school to get an MBA. And I didn't. Now I'm going to have a kid, which means my life is over. <laughs> I would never be able to do this. <laughs> I panicked and my husband, uh, he's extremely supportive, um, great husband. Uh, he said, no, don't worry about it. We'll figure out a way to do it. If that's what you want to do, we'll figure out a way. So, uh, <laughs> we, well, so during my pregnancy, I started preparing for GMAT and Scout. So I used at one time because these were like a three and a half hour exams practice exams you take, right? And <laughs> sitting here with full belly, you know, <laughs> I used to think, oh my God, what, you know, what's wrong with me? People in my situation would just go out, eat and enjoy, get pampered. And here I'm actually sitting and taking me an hour's exam. Like there's something wrong with me, right? But I went through it and applied and uh, got into Columbia Business School. Um, decided to yeah, decided to do an executive MBA because it's a weekend program so that I, you know, um, my daughter was five months old when I started the program. Um, so that was, um, I don't know what to call it, but it's a very interesting period because I had work, I was working full time and I had a baby at home when baby. I was going to school uh, over the weekend. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's hard I enough to manage you know, one, like, hard enough to manage one, you were managing three. So how was that? Uh, tell us, how did you manage that? Um, I, you know, I have to, you know, give credit, thanks to my family, my husband and his parents also moved in with me at that time um, to support us. So my mother-in-law was at home, you know, taking it. So I had the good family support. Uh, I think that really helped me uh, quite a bit. And my husband was supportive and in at and you know, I had a big enough team and it was kind of running on autopilot. So that also helped a little bit. Um, I think timing wise, it actually worked. You know, the theater, the logic we, with my husband, I came up with this maybe convenient logic. I don't know. <laughs> when the baby is small, all they really need is somebody to feed them and change them. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. So we, we, as long as it's baby infant, we're okay. But as they grow, then you need to be involved as a parent and you need to do, you know, you want to be. So that's how we kind of uh, came up with, okay, maybe this is actually not a bad time because we're going to have a support system anyway. So yeah. let's just <laughs> take advantage of it. That's true. <laughs> so uh, then you did your MBA. How was that yeah. experience? Did you enjoy the experience at Columbia? Yeah, very much enjoyed it. I felt like for the first case time study in method? life. Yeah, case, case study. study. It's a, okay. yeah, Columbia, you know, uh, most, I guess maybe most business schools are case studies. Um, it was just a fascinating, fascinating for me because I felt like for the first time in my life, I learned for the sake of learning. <laughs> I developed the love for learning. It was not for getting a job or like uh, passing an exam. It was not any of that. It was like truly learning. Um, loved economic, you know, it's just fascinating to sit there and listen to Nobel laureate professors uh, talking about global issues and all of that. So I really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed um, that experience. It was hard, but very enjoyable. Great. So then uh, uh, tell us about the next uh, phase of the journey. Um, yeah. So once I graduated, uh, this was 2009, interestingly enough, <laughs> um, you know, the stock market crash and all of that, um, even though I was kind of hoping to leave at and and do something different, that wasn't that happened to be not right time because there were no jobs at that time, right? 
So I, but, you know, but it's still, I, you know, you make the best of what you have. So with an at and you know, cloud um, infrastructure is where it, yeah, it into looking to invest. So I moved to the business side, leading the cloud infrastructure program. And figured, you know what, if I move to business, I get some business experience as well as, um, you know, it's a new technology and stuff. So I did that for a few years. And then uh, this is where I think, um, you know, the other change happened where one of the guys that I used to work with at and was leaving and uh, going to join NBC Universal. Uh, he was to run NBC Media Labs, we called it then. Uh, it was a innovation and emerging technology uh, team. He was leading that. And um, I used to work with him uh, sort of like outside of my job, uh, evaluating new technologies and giving advice to CTO, like a backup pro bono type of activity. That's how he knew me well. Uh, he asked me if I wanted to join him. I said, sure. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for me to do something new, something different. Um, so that's how I joined NBC Universal. And after a couple of years, he left. But then I stayed on and I ran the team further. I think I was at the NBC for about uh, five years or so. And then a still lot of opportunity came up at the time. Um, and then I said, okay, yeah, you know what? Yet another different industry, different thing. Well, let me go try that. <laughs> But you are not worried that uh, this is not an industry you don't know anything about, per se. Yes, it is tech. Uh, it is supply chain, which is stuff you know very well. So, well, it is exciting. It is beauty. It is fashion. So hey, who the hell can can say no to Estee Lauder? But uh, thought process in your mind uh, when you made a decision because it helps uh, inform our guests also. See, I mean... For me, taking chances is part of my life, part of life, right? Um, if you don't, then life is too boring. I, like you said it yourself, I don't like to be an autopilot. I, you know, I like to learn things. I want to, this is what I actually tell my team and anybody, like when you get up in the morning, you want to be excited to come to work and you should look forward to coming to work and do work. The day you don't feel that, it's time to change. <laughs> you got to think about, okay, what do I do? What do I need to do? So that's how I feel. Like, you know, once you are in a job for five years, I think the learning stuff, you feel content, you, you, uh, you plateau. Um, right. It, that's how I felt at the end of uh, five years at NBC. And when Estelle Order came, I said, the brand new industry, I think it's something for me to learn. What could go wrong? Worst case, I might lose the job in about a year. Uh -huh. So what? Uh, right. That's okay. There'll be a lot of job. You know, I have enough skills at this point that I'll find something else. But I think it's great that I can learn something new and at the same time contribute and, you know, bring my... And they were actually looking for my expertise, my type of expertise, which is uh, emerging technologies. The brand... Um, president at that time was looking for how do we innovate and how do we improve our consumer experiences with new technologies because in China and stuff, the consumers are very much tech savvy. So how do we introduce new technologies to engage with the consumers, et cetera. And he also wanted somebody with different background who has seen different things and not just the same old stuff. So I think, you know, that I fit that expectation there. Yeah. Yeah, here I am. And then two years later, when the supply chain opportunity came, I was like, hmm, supply chain, I've never done this before. Yes, I touched a little bit in my master's, which was almost 20 plus years ago. <laughs> but um, uh, I said it's a, in Estelle Auto, supply chain is a um, really backbone of the company, very complex because we operate in uh, 150 plus countries and affiliates and stuff. And we have 25 brands with, you know, so many thousands of SKUs and stuff. So it's a very complex supply chain ecosystem. Um, you know, what's more challenging than that? <laughs> making something like that? Yeah. And uh, you're up, always up for challenges. And I think so the message uh, to the listeners is uh, don't 
let yourself hit a plateau or make sure when you wake up, you're excited, no matter what it is, work, nonprofit, et cetera, you're excited and challenged about what you do. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, it's been an incredible journey, uh, Somia. So I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions that when you look back, uh, you know, um, can you talk about a few of your favorite childhood memories? Um, I mean, there are a lot, <laughs> but if I have to probably summarize, it would be, you know, going to my grandparents' village during holidays. Uh, hanging out with cousins and friends when you were little. I think that was definitely my, one of my favorite memories. And another one is, you know, uh, where, we come, where I come from, Sankranti is the biggest holiday for us. Um, because of it's a mostly farming community where the crop comes home at that time. And it's, uh, it's kind of like a Thanksgiving uh, in a way, uh, right? So it was big and we did like three days of celebrations and different things. It's like a, lead, a month of different things leading up to it. It, it was, a, you know, that's one of my favorite memory of the things that we did uh, during that time. Um, so being with the grandparents and Sankranti, which is... I, if I'm remembering, it's January 14th is when Sankranti happened. It's a big, big thing, uh, spring festival, sp different ways celebrated. So uh, those are great memories. Uh, so Somia, when you look at uh, Somia, who was looking for uh, a teaching assistantship at NC State, going professor to professor, uh, her definition of success at that time probably was if I get an, uh, a teaching assistantship that I don't have to pay uh, for tuition, that's my definition of success to today. Uh, I presume your uh, definition of success has changed over time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what is your definition of success now over a period of time now? Yeah, so, you know, like you said, you know, it was originally getting the assistantship, right? But then later on, it became about a promotion or a title, better title or like a better job, that kind of stuff. But now I think it's, a, I've, I've certainly evolved over a period of time. And um, now for me, it, it's all about um, the kind of impact that I create uh, in the broader community, whether it be within my company or within the family or the general community. That's what really means a lot to me. So um, things that, uh, if I just look at job, like, you know, it's not about promotion or a title anymore. It's about, okay, what kind of difference am I making in the company? What kind of impact am I creating? By leading my organization, by changing the culture and taking it forward, you know, those kinds of things. Similarly, I'm very much big into mm, uh, women in technology, encouraging more women in technology. I mm, created that uh, ERG within Estee Lauder, um, you know, that grew to be very big. And, you know, I, so we do a lot of things and um, that kind of impact for me speaks, you know, volumes for me. I really enjoy that part of it. And similarly, you know, in general, encouraging kids in STEM fields. And I am on the board with, for my daughter's high school. Um, so through that, I do a lot of work there as well. So to me, like these are the types of things that creating that kind of an impact in the broader community is what I call success at this time. Oh, so I think paying it forward, uh, that's what the definition has changed for you, which is very, very commendable. Uh, Somia, you talked a little bit about it, but uh, we ask our guests and they all talk about the role of mentors in their uh, life. Uh, do you think mentors play an important role? And they come in different shapes, sizes, parents, grandparents, this, that. Uh, what is your uh, perspective on uh, mentors? Like you said, it does come in various shapes and forms and uh, you know you may not always have a person designated as a mentor that may not happen right but you can I mean I in my lifetime I 
reached out to, I looked up to some people who I reached out to and said, I know, talk to them saying, and here is where I am. What's your advice for me? How do I deal? Can you help me? And I always run something. So, so there are a few people like that, that played an important role for me, advising me. Um, and also there are, I call it distant mentors, where I'm some of the executives that are, let's say, in my um, vicinity right now, I look up to them and I see what they do, their personality and some of the things that they do. And I pick up their best qualities and say, you know what, that's what I want to do. As an example, in Estee Lauder, like my CIO, Michael Smith, um, he is very much into, he calls it culture of joy. He really cares about employees being happy and, you know, he wants them to be excited when they're at work and really, as a company, ELC is a very, very much family-oriented company, very familiar culture. And most executives are that way and they treat employees that way. I felt like I picked up that side of it and I'm working hard to sort of uh, you know, enhance that um, in me. So there are a few executives like that I look up to and say, you know what, those are the qualities I want to emulate. So I kind of call that as a mentorship, even though they're not directly mentoring me, but I think I look to them as <laughs> mentors in that sense. Um, Great point. So you can have formal mentors, but what you're saying is those distant mentors where you admire someone and try to imbibe their uh, qualities, their characters, values, etc. That's an uh, excellent point, uh, Somia. Um, Somia, towards the end, we ask a lightning round of questions. So, you know, short uh, questions, uh, short answers. So we wanted to, uh, uh, our podcast is called Indianness, and we ask all our guests and everybody has a different definition. What is your uh, definition of Indianness? You know, as I say, you can take Indian out of India, but you can't take India out of Indian. <laughs> I, th <laughs> I think that, that is so true. You know, we're all well nationalated in the U.S. Our Indian culture is so deep rooted. We as expats are the faith of India to the world. And, you know, we need to represent, we represent the best of what India is all about. Uh, for me, it's that bringing the culture and best of both worlds um, not really forgetting about where we came from and, you know, embracing that both cultures and living it and passing it on to, you know, our next generation. Oh, very well said. You know, embracing both yeah. cultures, uh, and, you know, and passing it on to the next generation. Uh, great points. Uh, one person, Somia, that uh, not related to you living either in India or outside India that you admire or somebody of Indian origin living? I would say probably Indira Nuri, I knew uh, that. former PepsiCo CEO. Uh -huh. <laughs> but anyway, we had just someone, uh, I think yesterday or day before, say the same. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Great choice. I felt like, you know, I, you know, she's also another person who came like me, right, uh, from India and made her own life for herself and Went to such a great high, one of the best CEOs in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Most successful CEOs in the world. So I really admire her. Um, I think, yeah, great she's choice. amazing. Uh, uh, one person who's been the most influential in your life, one uh, in your journey, the most influential person in your journey. Uh, probably my mom. I, I want to say my parents, but like my mom and dad together Pick one. in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would say my mom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She is a very different woman. Um, yeah. Again, doesn't fit the mold. Yeah. 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 Obviously. Uh, <laughs> it's very progressive. So, yeah. Uh, uh, great choice. Uh, is there a book or a movie that has uh, profoundly impacted you? Uh, any, any of that? Um, I mean, there are a lot of good books, but if I have to pick one, I would say uh, Freakonomics is one of the best books that I felt, you know, because that really inspired me to study economics and it really um, taught me in love for ec economics. And 
showed me how a small decision can change. You can have a huge impact yeah. over a period of time. Yeah, uh, another good choice. <clears throat> uh, Somia, Nike's tagline is just do it. If you had a <laughs> tagline, what would that be? I mean, I never thought about it this way, but um, in lately in the past few years, I hear myself saying repeatedly to my team and others, like, we need to start somewhere. <laughs> so what I mean to say is, um, you know, when you look at some, what you need to do, it may look overwhelming, uh, insurmountable kind of a thing, but don't wait for that perfect opportunity to start. Let's just start somewhere and let's get going. And even, even if you achieve half of it, it's still better than, you know, nothing where we are today. So let, we need to start somewhere. That's usually I end up saying a lot. Uh, yeah. Let's start somewhere. I like that. Uh, you got to start somewhere. And last thing, uh, because uh, we touched on it in the beginning, you were going to talk about it is you wanted to be a pilot, but now you in the U.S., you did become a pilot. So give us a sh quick uh, snippet to our audience as to how and what happened. Um, so interestingly enough, when I met my husband and we were talking and all of that, and then found out that he also wanted to be, be a pilot and that he actually took a couple of lessons, but didn't really, you know, uh, go further. So when his interest and my interest, we we're like, oh my God, yeah, let's do it together. So that's how, you know, once we got married and we went, we felt we had, you know, some decent amount of money to <laughs> afford, uh, we started uh, uh, training together, both of us. And uh, yeah, that's how, yeah. <laughs> so now are you a licensed pilot just for our audience to know? Yep. I am a licensed, I'm a private pilot. Wow. Yep. So that tells you, hey, when you put your mind to it, she wanted to do it in, uh, Andhra Pradesh, and now she's a licensed pilot in the U.S. So uh, congratulations, Somia. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing, amazing journey. And thank you for being so open. Not easy, but uh, thank you really for taking the time. It's been great, great inspirational conversation. Now, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's great. It was so easy to <laughs> talk to you and uh, yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. No, thank you. Thank you so much.